Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to review the book, The Courage to Be Happy. And this book is a sequel to the book I just recently reviewed on this channel, The Courage to Be Disliked. Both books are written by the same authors, Ichiro Kishimi and Fumitake Koga. So I am going to focus on the sequel in this video. As before, I'm going to begin with a brief summary of the book, then move to what I liked about the book, the few things that I liked, enjoyed, and then I'm going to talk about my criticism what I see to be the limitations of, of this book. And then at the end, I will suggest some further readings if you're interested in continuing to explore some of the topics that are prominent discussed in this book. There are other places to go, some of them better. All right, let's begin with a summary. The two characters that we met in the first book, The Courage to be Disliked, they return and they return to their discussion. They continue discussing the topics of happiness, life, the tasks of life, the relationship between individual and community. And they talk about these topics through the lens of Alfred Adler's psychology, the psychology of Af Alfred Adler, which is also known as individual psychology. What is different from the previous book? What is different in the second book, The Courage to be Happy? Is that the two characters are moving into new territories. Mostly these new territories are related to social relationships. They talk about education, the relationship between students and teachers. They return to the topic of why it is wrong to praise or reproach students. They also extend the conversation into the topic of friendship and romantic love and the role of believing in someone, trusting someone and committing, making a commitment, choosing someone and the meaning of that decision. The tone of the conversation is different. The young man in this second book is more emotional and he's aggravated and there's also even some resentment in his tone. Since we left him in the previous book, we read that the young man has now become a teacher, an educator, and he's trying to apply and teach what he has learned to his students. He's frustrated because he, conf he has confronted a reality that seems to be not receptive to his ideas. Seems He seems to be failing to apply these ideas in the in the context of his teaching and he's returning to the old man and trying to blame the ideas he sees the ideas as the source of failure there are two recurrent themes in this book so th things that keep repeating first many times during the dialogue uh, the young man accuses adlerian psychology of being like a religion or being like a cult that's the first theme it keeps coming up the second recurrent theme is that many times during the dialogue the young man accuses the philosopher, the old man, of having no relevance to the real world, no relevance to the real human relationships, to the real concrete situation, for example, the concrete situation of a classroom. He accuses the old man of being out of touch with reality. He brings up the idea that these beautiful philosophical, psychological concepts, they are good, they sound good, but they are really useless when it comes to living our lives and dealing with the actual practical matters. All right, so that was a summary. Now let's get to a few things that I liked and appreciated about this book. First, there are a couple of good points, very thought provoking in the discussion on education, the way that they handle the topic of education. They begin with the core concept of respect for the students and they highlight the idea that respect, having respect for students is key to being a good teacher. And the thought that the classroom is a place where students, some students for the first time can begin practicing horizontal relationships in their in the home. They have relationships with their parents or caregivers, two people, two agents that have a vertical relationship to, to each other. One of them is more in charge, has more rights and more duties, more responsibilities and more power over the other person. Moving into the classroom should involve moving and practicing relationships that are more horizontal. So power is more equally distributed. Power and responsibility and rights are more equally distributed across the, the parties relationship among equals. This leads to the idea that the classroom, regardless of what goes on outside of the classroom, the classroom itself should be modeled after a democratic nation or de a democratic microcosm. Next, the argument against uh, praising and rebuking students that was also in the first book. The first book, we saw that argument that we should not praise or re reproach students. They return to that argument in the second book. And I think that the argument becomes clear, more effective, more precise, and it made more sense to me in this second book. So let me try to very briefly tell you my understanding of that. Why? One reason why that's not a good idea to praise and reproach students. 
We don't praise or reproach students because doing so might imply that there is only a single set of ideals, a single set of standards against which we evaluate all students. So for example, if I praise one student and pra don't praise another student, it might suggest that there is only one way for all students to be good. And the first students that I, that I praised is better, is moving closer to that ideal. But in the ideal scenario, if every student works very hard and equally talented, they should all be the same. They should all be the copies of that one standard, one model student. In other words, it implies that all students can only differ from each other quantitatively in terms of measurement, not qualitatively. But the matter of fact is that students don't just differ from each other quantitatively, they also have qualitative differences. They have talents that are qualitatively different. There are different types of talents. One is talented in music, the other one is, is talented in visual arts, drawing. One might be talented in, in dancing, one might be a good speaker, talented in language. So these are not all striving towards a single model of a good student, but they are just qualitatively different. And we, we avoid praising and reproaching students to avoid giving them that impression. So that's my understanding of uh, why we should not praise and reproach. Next, the older philosopher at one point uh, during the conversation diagnoses the deeper and relatively less conscious problems of the young man. He tells the young man very gently that his concerns, his superficial concerns, he, the concerns that he's expressing, overtly expressing, his concerns with education are not the primary concerns. They are not his real concerns, in other words. He's worried about something on the surface, but the, at the deeper level, something else is really bothering him. Namely, the problem with not being able to rely on himself, psychologically and emotionally. In other words, deep down, his problem is that he doesn't like who he is. He doesn't like himself enough to be able to relate to other people. So what the older man is doing, the philosopher is doing in the conversations, is that he's gently, without dismissing him, he's very gently and artfully redirects their conversation without dismissing the points raised by the young man. That is a very instructive thing to read and to try to model in our interactions. Finally, something else I liked, at one moment in the conversation, as the young man kept insisting that their ideas have no relevance to the real world, they have no application in reality, the older philosopher pushes back and says, the constant reference to the real world can itself be a symptom. Can itself be a symptom that he's trying to repress something. He's trying to run away from something. So this is something that it, it matters to me too. This is a concern of mine when I'm thinking about philosophy and psychology. When we dismiss an abstract idea because it seems to have no relevance to the real world, is it possible that we are doing something that we don't fully understand? Is it possible that we are dismissing something not just because it doesn't have relevance? What is the real world that we are talking about anyways? Isn't the concept of the real world itself an abstract concept? The concept of real, real world itself is an abstract concept. It's not a thing that we can point to. The concept of real world is usually in that kind of context, in that kind of conversation, it's something out there that we are referring to. We are talking about the real world out there, outside of the classroom, outside of the the, the context of the conversation. And what is it that we are dismissing in favor of that real world? What we are dismissing in favor of the real world is an idea that might be very alive to us right now and right here. It's something right here. It is something concrete. It is something real. It might be coming from a real concern of a real person. In other words, we might be dismissing something because we don't have the patience to explore it far enough, long enough, patiently enough, in order to find its application to the real world, to, to, to realize or to construct its application. So that might be an excuse, that, that knee-jerk reaction that, okay, this sounds good, but it doesn't have uh, applications in the real world. So we should be skeptical about that kind of dismissive attitude. All right, so those were the things that I liked about the book. Now let's get to what I see to be the limitations of the book, the things that I didn't like. First, the character of the young man is written in this second book in a very sloppy way. He is designed to do too many things at once. He has become a mouthpiece for many different concerns. And as a result, he has lost his unity. The character has lost his unity. He's not, he's not a real person anymore. He's no longer a character. In the first book, there was more unity and coherence in the character of the young man. But here, the character is ruined in order to let the authors cram in as many topics, different topics into, into the conversation as possible. In other words, they have stretched this character of the young man to include too many things 
to give voice to too many different concerns and the character has lost its realness. Now you might object to my point here and say, this is a fictional character, don't expect him to be real. But despite the fact that these characters are fictional, there should still be some realness. We should be, still be able to believe them. Just because a character is fictional, we should not be constantly reminded of that fact. The writing of a fictional character, when it is successful, that is when we forget the fact that they are fictional. If you are reminded of the fact that the character is fictional, is not real, has no resemblance to real people, that is when writing of a fictional character has failed. Second, one of the big topics in the book is the topic of being self-reliant, being able to rely on your own judgment, your own thinking, as opposed to following other people's thoughts, judgments, opinions. But the authors don't really get into why that is necessary and how that is practiced. How do we get to a point where we don't rely on other people's opinions, but instead rely on our own judgments, our own thoughts? In a conversation between you and I, why should you choose your viewpoint over mine? If you and I aren't essentially different from each other, if you are a person and I'm a person too, it seems arbitrary and random to pick one of the two people and say, I trust this person and don't trust the other person. I follow the opinions of this person, but not this person. After all, I am just one person among other people. What is it that makes me special? Here, the authors should have distinguished between the process of forming judgments and the judgments themselves. It's neither you or I that should be the ultimate judge, that should have the ultimate judgment. Instead, it should be the right method, the right process of arriving at it. If you, if you get the right method, the right process, the process by which we arrive at the right opinion, then it shouldn't matter who has applied that process. We should recognize it if I have done it, if you have done it, if a third person has done it. That is what allows us to go beyond the arbitrary selection of one person over others. You become self-reliant, I become self-reliant by understanding the method of how do we arrive at the right judgments. Being dogmatic is wrong, even if it is a dogmatic attachment to one's own initial judgments. I think the unsuccessful handling of this issue is not an accidental feature of this book because after all, this book is built on the authority of Alfred Adler. And how can we expect the authors to give us a method of arriving at the right opinions if they are relying on the authority of Alfred Adler? So it's for that reason, I don't see it as an accidental limitation, but as a structural essential weakness of the book. All right, so further readings. If you like the, the, some of the topics in this book, education, love, commitment, Obviously, Eric Fromm is mentioned in his book, The Art of Loving. I think that would be a good place to go after reading this book. Eric Fromm, The Art of Loving. Another book that I like about love is Alain Badiou's In Praise of Love. It's a beautiful and very short book about the topic of love. On the topic of education, I have two books that I really like. One of them is How to Face Education by Glenn Wallace. The other one is a short book called A Primer for Philosophy and Education by Sam Rocha. Both of these books are short. They're both about education, but they're also both about, not just about education, but about what it means to be a human person, what it means to learn, what it means to, to relate consciously, reflectively to one's own intellectual development. And finally, I would recommend, I should have recommended this in the previous video when I was discussing the courage to be disliked. It's a book called Finite and Infinite Games. Uh, it is related to the topic of human relationships and it is also uh, related to the metaphor of dance and play as an approach to life, which is also discussed in both of these books. All right, I hope you enjoyed the review. If you have any feedback, any thoughts on these books, on my reviews, let me know. Uh, otherwise, I will speak with you in the next video. Thank you.